Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Cirrus Report. My name is Ken Shorjan. I'm here with London Paul. And Paul, over the weekend, there was a very interesting event that took place, probably a shocker to many, uh, that came out of Yemen. And it is really, for all intents and purposes, it puts the stamp of approval that the U.S., in its ability to support proxy wars around the world, is little more than a paper tiger. Anyway, Paul, I want to thank you as always for being a part of the discussion and some very fascinating things going on geopolitically. Yeah, and thanks obviously as well for joining today too. You okay? Oh yeah, I, sorry, I, I, thought, I thought I'd I, sorry. I, I had segued lost. into you to go ahead and uh, talk okay, about it. Okay, yeah, album. well, obviously you sent me a link regarding which relates to an incident that happened over on the 15th of September, which was the Yemenis uh, struck Tel Aviv with what was perceived to be a hypersonic missile. And we'll come on to how did they get a hypersonic missile shortly. But just a bit of background on this, because they came out and explained, obviously, yes, they targeted Tel Aviv. And they go, and there were some particulars released about this hypersonic missile that apparently has a range of over 2,000 kilometers. It has equipped with stealth technology. It can reach a speed of Mach 16. Unlike a lot of hypersonics, they're very highly maneuverable. And, uh, and really, the Iron Dome uh, defense system is useless against them. Like all our defense systems, are useless against hypersonic missiles. So, of course, this raises a number of questions. Firstly, where did they get it from? Now, you made the point, Ken, before we came on, and Russia alluded to the fact that it might supply uh, such technologies to countries who, you know, who are obviously enemies of our of those nations we support now. Why I think it's not likely to be Russia in this case is because as much as the Russian relationship with Israel is not what it once was since the start of this Gaza war, they're not likely to provide what could be termed a weapon of significant uh, destructive purposes to another country to launch it at uh, Israel. And they kind of have this kind of quasi-agreement not to do things like that. So the logical argument, even though they've denied it, would be it came from Iran. So, of course, let's assume it is Iran. Then, therefore, on that basis, that will raise questions inside not just Israel, but the United States and uh, as to, well, we kind of thought they had hypersonics, and now it's clearly they do. And what does this mean in the broader context for, for, from the U.S.'s perspective and Israel's security in West Asia? And this, again, demonstrates very clearly why the United States is extremely vulnerable in West Asia. People make big deals about the fact that they have all these carrier strike groups, aircraft carriers, in in the Gulf, in the Mediterranean. And to be honest, when you look at the advent of hypersonic, they're meaningless. They are just cosmetic paper tigers, literally. They, what are they going to do? Because quite literally, a hypersonic missile is going to take out an aircraft carrier, no problem. And they have high precision accuracy, and that's just going to sink them. They have no answer. They have no defense capability against them. And is it perhaps a surprise that quite quietly recently the United States has moved several aircraft carriers out of West Asia and they've gone sort of puffing the paper tiger chest out now in Asia Pacific and they'll sail around there for a bit doing nothing in particular. And then they'll head off home and when they don't think anyone's watching... And the principal reason the U.S. will do this is because they don't want them to be sunk because the optics would be horrendous, even though we know they're 
useless in, in the modern warfare era. It still looks particularly bad for the US. And they've had enough kind of bad publicity in the region when they kind of left Afghanistan with the proverbial tail between their legs. And literally overnight were told to go and they left. Um, and of course, they're suffering other embarrassing situations, such as Niger came out today and said, well, the US has left in totality. Now, of course, the US had a huge drone base there. Well, they no longer have access to that. So this, again, is in keeping with countries in the global south saying enough is enough. Uh, Iraq came out again today and made the statement, well, because the US keeps going, well, we've got rid of ISIS out of Iraq, which, of course, is I mean, they didn't do anything of the sort. And ISIS is, of course, a Western-backed creation anyway. But they've, you know, used that stick to beat the Americans with and say, look, you need to go. You know, we keep telling you leave, just go. We'll give you, I don't know, a year, 18 months notice, but you're, you've got to go. And, of course, the U.S. will just try to ignore this, but eventually they'll get kicked out of Iraq also. But coming back to the point regarding Yemen, this raises questions because the argument with regards to Israel is, well, has Lebanon got these missiles and we don't know they've got them? You know, who else has got them? And, and you know, if they pose a threat to the Iron Dome and its ability to defend Israel, then that's an enormous headache for the Israelis. It also is a headache for the US because Israel will try and respond to this and how they respond, you know, could drag the United States inadvertently into a, 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 an escalation. And I'm going to come back to the point because I still get people telling me that uh, Israel wants war with Iran. Well, given that uh, October the 7th is coming around, it's nearly a year ago, please explain to me then when this war that the United States so desperately craved against Iran is going to start. Because it's nearly a year and it hasn't happened. Back in April, the US did everything to stop an escalation between Israel and Iran. Everything has been done to try and stop another escalation between Israel and Iran as a result of Haniyeh getting uh, obviously killed in Tehran. And thus far, Iran hasn't responded. Uh, but So you get the point that the US doesn't want that kind of escalation because, again, militarily, it has no answer. I mean, what's it going to do? In, in West Asia, what's it going to do against Iran or Lebanon? It doesn't have boots on the ground. It can't put them there. What's it going to do? Fire a few missiles at, uh, at what exactly? And then half an hour later, its entire fleet sunk. And the US would probably never recover from such a humiliating instance. So it doesn't want that kind of humiliation. And it's interesting, just as a small side note, that it seems all there's claims that Iran is preparing for an escalation in the conflict with Lebanon and the US has come out and gone, just don't do this. And people, again, will find this impossible to believe. It's a total contradiction that they support Israel, but there isn't a contradiction. This isn't binary thinking. There's nothing contradictory about not wanting Israel to escalate the war in any way, shape or form, but supporting Israel inside of what goes on in Gaza. That is a contained situation as far as the US is concerned, which is pretty myopic thinking, but that's the thinking. As soon as you drag other countries in, we're just highlighting why if Yemen gets involved with hypersonic missiles what, and how many has it got, it could escalate that whole conflict into something far worse than it is now. And as we say, the US is a paper tiger, so it cannot defend itself in West Asia in any way, shape or form, rather like it couldn't, can't defend itself in Afghanistan and left. And, you know, it's increasingly under attack also in Iraq itself. And its defence, it can't offer any defence against far more primitive missile technology, very damaging still, but it's in no position whatsoever to defend itself in West Asia. And that's why it does tie in with this incident that obviously happened with uh, Israel and these Yemeni armed forces, um, obviously uh, attacking Tel Aviv. And just one final point on this 
just this bit about West Asia, is it's very telling that there are also claims coming out that the Pentagon basically said to the Houthis, we're prepared to recognize you as a legitimate government in Yemen, provided you stop the blockade of the Red Sea. I mean, and of course, the Houthis are going to say we're not interested, but I'll park that there. We'll come back to the point about the Red Sea. And then I want to extend this discussion as to why in a broader context, the US is indeed this paper tiger. There's a couple of uh, interesting points that um, analyst uh, Colonel McGregor put out uh, regarding the US and it's our, our assertion about it being a paper tiger and trying to fight the last war. Um, one of the things he annotated was the president is going to waste more money on an old force stru structure and that they remain stuck in a World War II Cold War paradigm. Now, there was a couple of examples that recently I saw that show this is exactly what the U.S., their mindset and their capabilities are. There was a video out I ran across yesterday. I had uh, President Putin visiting a lieutenant colonel who had gotten injured in the defense of the Kursk region. And he spoke to him and he talked to a little bit with him about uh, what type of defense strategies and, and maneuver, maneuvering that they did in there. And he was so impressed, he said, this is, this is the type of uh, leader that we need and that he is uh, inviting him to immediately move up and go to the general staff college. So instantaneous because of their ability, he's taking combat uh, ready individuals and moving them into positions of higher leadership. Meanwhile, you take a look at the United States, our secretary of defense, the uh, spokesperson for the Pentagon, the head of the joint chiefs, all of those, all of them are generals and admirals who never saw combat and were there simply for political appointments. Their capabilities in leadership have been proven from Afghanistan to trying to build a $350 million bridge to nowhere in Gaza to, and you could just name them off the thing. This is exactly what the, the whole point is, is that the United States in their hegemonic desire to rule the world relying upon the proxy wars that were used in the Cold War, relying upon allies that are doing asymmetrical uh, type of warfare, like we saw with being willing to plant an explosive to kill one single individual months in advance, like they did inside Tehran. And then today reports that they cyber hacked the, the pagers of Hezbollah individuals in Lebanon this is something that the U.S. would never even potentially think, but this is what modern warfare is all about. And Houthis having access to hypersonic missiles that can hit right into the heart of capital cities. This is something the U.S. in their big fleets and their big aircraft carriers no longer uh, recognize as being you know, functional in today's modern warfare. Yeah, absolutely. That's the biggest problem. The US is still thinks modern warfare is like it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. And it's not. And really, even if you go back two years ago and to the start of the Ukraine war, there's developments happening as the wars as the wars progressed that we didn't see at the start of the war. I know, you know, the the Russians, for example, have deployed these old glide bombs, they've adjusted them technologically and they're using them to devastating effect in Ukraine. So, and also all the drone technology, how that's developed. And it's happening rapidly during the course of a war. So the US is totally ill-equipped. It cannot fight a conventional war in any way, shape or form. It's totally incapable of doing so. Yes, it can go in to Iraq 20 years ago or so, blow it up and then send the cavalry in and go, look, we want a war. 
Yes, because the there was no the opposition didn't have any way of defending itself. That's the what the US is was capable of doing. It's and that's all it's capable of doing now. But that no longer applies, and that's why the US is totally incapable of of offering any resistance to what the Houthis are doing in the Red Sea. They have total control of it, and that's why the US is begging them to stop in return for recognizing the government, which, of course, they won't trust the US, so they won't take any notice of that. But it just, again, highlights the weakness of the US. It's also why I'm not going to reiterate the previous kind of uh, podcast we did about uh, why the US can't go to war with China, but we've discussed all that, but it's exactly the same reason. So the US cannot challenge anyone who it perceives to A, have nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction. So China's off the table. It can't go to war with Russia direct. So it fights these this proxy war with, uh, with Ukraine, which has been a total disaster. So the US proves it can't fight conventional war because it has been a conventional war. It certainly can't go to war with Iran for the same reasons. Then I think a point worth making is... But okay, we're working on the assumption that there was a third world war. We've made the point there isn't going to be, but let's just assess why the US is a paper tiger in terms of that. Well, it has no answer to Russian modern nuclear arsenal, the Sarmat, etc. All those hypersonic missiles that can be armed with nuclear weapons. So it's in no position to be able to defend itself against those even though, of course, the United States' air defense systems on the east and west coast are useless. And if you go, and and people will not believe this, but just go and find out yourself, because to all intents and purposes, that's exactly what the Pentagon has stated previously in recent years. Also, it's known for a fact that because hypersonics have such a long range and the speed they travel, irrespective of the air defense systems on the east and west coast, they can come up from the south and they can travel up and then there's absolutely nothing on the border with Mexico or Canada to to defend themselves. So they're just a sitting duck. And the US knows this. It's also not only can it not defend itself as a nation state, and which is why it never wants to have World War III with, with Russia. The other biggest problem the US has It has a decrepit old um, nuclear arsenal itself, decades old. They spend billions a year just making sure that the the nuclear arsenal is stable. They cannot take the risk of launching these nuclear weapons because there, there is a serious risk they'll detonate in their silos, so they'll detonate before they even effectively get off the ground. Or maybe they'll detonate as soon as they get off the ground. So then that's an air burst over the United States itself. So they don't have the technology to, to like the Russians do in terms of uh, a, new, a modern nuclear arsenal. The Russians is very modern. So that's an enormous problem the US has as well. And therefore, it's in no position to defend itself. It's in no position... To, to go to war with any country that has this kind of technology. We know the Chinese have it, the Russians have it, the Iranians have it. The question is, we know North Korea has nuclear weapons, but does it have hypersonic missile technology? Has, have the Iranians given it to them? Somehow doubt the Russians and the Chinese would, but the Iranians could certainly give them that technology or access to that technology and they can make the missiles themselves. It's just, you know, maybe Iranian engineers, etc., have gone to, to North Korea and helped them make these weapons. So the US talks about this axis of evil. Well, it's in no position to do anything against this so-called axis of evil if it was to, to ever launch those kind of weapons at the US. I mean, it, it won't happen because you know there is going to be a US response to that. But this is why the US for a long time rested on its laurels on the basis that no one would dare uh, challenge the US. But we've seen in recent years how the US is very vulnerable, how it's been vulnerable in West Asia, 
how it's vulnerable uh, also because in Ukraine because of the fact it just couldn't, you know, it's been largely uh, responsible for tactical decisions, operational consideration, not all of them. And it, it's just been hopeless. And the mere fact that it genuinely imagined that it could go to war with Russia, defeat Russia, Russia's a major nuclear power, and, and somehow it, they could that was even possible. Russia could never lose this war because if they were threatened existentially, as far as they're concerned, then they go to the nuclear option. They've said that, and that's a statement of fact. So the US is never going to want to ever get to that situation. So how could it ever win a war? But that's the problem. They're resting on all this hubris, this arrogance, ignorance, as though modern technology is irrelevant and they're learning lessons all over major conflict zones that they simply are incapable of being able to, to participate in the war in any way, shape or form, and that they're extremely vulnerable and they're far too stretched. This is why having 800 bases all around the world is, is just you're incapable of defending anything. You're too thinly spread. And it was really just a psychological deterrent. And that deterrent doesn't apply anymore because the Houthis have demonstrated in the Red Sea that they're in control. And the US is and Israel are incapable of doing anything to stop that. We made the point at the time they couldn't do that. Now, if you've gone back, you know, a year or two ago, make these statements, people would have laughed at you and go, don't be ridiculous. Well, there's nothing ridiculous. It's a proven fact. The US now is militarily a paper tiger. It knows it is. It won't admit it, certainly in Congress level. But militarily, there's enough people inside the Pentagon and Langley who, which is why they don't want any form of escalation giving the Ukrainians access to, to missiles that could target deeper into Russia itself. Not It's all relative, of course, but, uh, but still there's a possibility. They don't want to sanction that because they know the US is a paper tiger militarily. Absolutely. And I think a great quote to... Uh and this conversation on is comes from Colonel McGregor himself, where he said, at this point, the DOD is the DMV, the Department of Military Vehicles, meaning they are great at moving hardware and personnel around, but not at much else. And that's the epitome. Anyway, Paul, I want to thank you as always for being a part of this great discussion. And likewise. And to everybody here at the Sears Report community, thank you for being a part as well. Don't forget to subscribe, comment, like, share. And until the next time we get together, everyone, have a great day.